so I've got to be in. I should turn in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 in my last message. Uh, in fact, uh, just for uh, Lottie and Rhonda's sake, uh, we're, doing, we're going through a series called Embracing Change, Changes That God Wants Us to Make in Our Life. And uh, each, what we do is that I take a verse, uh, I do an exposition on it, an exegesis on it, which I did on uh, verse 11, and then that's what to change, and then as we go through it, the second part of that verse is how to change. I don't want to just read something, and then God tell me to do something, and then I not do it, because I don't know how. So this is uh, just sort of uh, just a small review from where we were, uh, where I was uh, two months ago, uh, just sort of bring us back up to speed. So we were looking at verse 11. I want to read that. It says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. And the word that we looked at, if you'll remember, was the word reckon. It may be in your, uh, in your translation, it may be uh, the word consider, which I think is a, a very good word. It's not reckon in the way that we sometimes think of reckon. You know, it's like if my wife asked me to do something and I said, well, I, I reckon I will. That's not what she's looking for. She wants me to say that I will be glad to go out and do it for her. This word is a much deeper word. It's a Greek word, logizomai, and uh, it means uh, that, you, that you consider something in your mind. In fact, if you remember that I actually call this a mind word. It's a word that when I read it, when I come to it, uh, to, to reckon myself to be dead into sin, that I have to really think about what that means and how I'm actually going to implement that into my life. I can't just, I've got to think about it. Well, how, what does it mean to be dead to sin? What does it mean that I can be alive to God? And, and I want you to notice there, if you would, the emphasis that Paul says. He, he says, this is something that you have to do. It's something that I have to do. He says, you also Reckon yourselves to be dead. So God places on me this particular responsibility. We saw that this verb is uh, a present tense verb. It's in the imperative mood. And the present tense verb just simply means that it's something that we're to be doing all the time. I want you every day of your life to be reckoning, to be considering that you are dead to sin. I don't get Saturday off, right? You don't get Wednesday off because, because well, today I'm just going to sin all I want to. The reason is because that I'm dead to sin. But I'm alive to God. And those two things should be driving my life. They should be something that is pushing me and motivating me and encouraging me every day of my life that I that I get up, I reckon myself to be dead to sin. I'm not gonna live in sin. I may sin, I may fail, I may do something that God doesn't want me to do, but I'm just not going to live in it. I'm gonna seek his forgiveness, I'm gonna confess it, we're gonna move on. Uh, and that's, that's what this verse is saying. And so this particular Greek word means to put, it literally means to put together in one's mind to calculate. I'm getting ready to, I'm having to replace uh, all the shingles to re-roof our house and uh, Brenda wants me to put a roof over the front doors of the sun porch. It's got a lot of windows and uh, being an architect, I ought to just be able to just to figure out how to do that just like that and I can't really figure it out well. So I'm reasoning, I'm drawing little pictures, and I'm calculating and trying to figure out what has to be done in order for somebody to come in and build a porch over the deck and it not look awkward. 
And uh, she has all the confidence in the world that I can figure that out, right? And so I'm calculating, I'm reckoning, I'm, I'm evaluating, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And in this case, we are trying to clearly understand what it is that God wants us to do. There are things that God wants you to do. You have to accept that. You cannot live the Christian life independent of what God asks of us and what God requests of us. And so I have to earnestly think about it and how I can incorporate his commands and his principles and his biblical truth into my life. I don't want to just be ignorant. I don't want to just be somebody that, as a Christian, doesn't know what God wants me to do. But I, just knowing what God wants you to do is not sufficient. What we want to happen is not only that we know what to do, but then we figure out how to incorporate into our life what it is that God wants us to do. Whatever it is. And for all of us, it's probably the same. Uh, to live our life in such a way that Christ is glorified. In, in the scriptures, uh, I just want to say it, I've said this many times before, there's nothing small or insignificant about a present tense imperative mood verb in the Bible. And the reason for that is is really very simple is because the verbs or the imperative mood verbs are the verbs that actually where God it, they're the verbs that let us know how much we are really going to obey God uh, they're the verbs that God uses to define whether or not we are actually serious are not serious about him and about his truth and about what he wants to do in us. Obviously, uh, and this is basic Christianity 101, it doesn't do us any good uh, to read the word, but then never to incorporate that word into our life. Everybody would agree with that, right? It just doesn't do me any good. So when I sit down to read, I've got, I mean, I have, no, I have all kinds of notebooks, and every time I open my Bible, I've got notebooks. I have multiple notebooks that I write in, that I take notes in, that I, I, uh, I, I write it down. I go back and I review them on a periodic basis. I'm doing writing a commentary on Romans. Uh, I just, uh, I'm writing, I'm going back, I'm rewriting a commentary on First Peter. It's just... Uh, I, I want to know what God has to say. So God is simply saying, when we get here to verse 11, God is simply saying that he wants us to think in such a way that we are always inclined. If you're taking notes, you ought to write that down. He wants you to think in such a way that you're always inclined to choose what is godly rather than choosing what is ungodly. Life is always going to give you choices, right? You cannot bypass this. You'll always, you'll always be forced to make choices. The Word forces you to make choices. Uh, and so God's truth always creates a personal responsibility for us to obey it. I, I can't just read it. I can't just go to it and read it. But then, can, then just think that it has no impact on my life, what I just read. I am, if you go back and read it, I am to reckon. I am to consider. I am to evaluate. I am to deliberate. I am to think about. This is a mind word about <laughs> what it is that God is asking me to do. How God is asking me to live in my life. And the spiritual reality is that until someone actually embraces the truth of God's word uh, that they are confronted with in his word, that that, that that word that they read, that word that they know, can never really have an impact on them 
until they incorporate it into their life. Now, there are a lot of people that read the Bible this way. They read it to read it. But they do not read it to incorporate it into their life. It's like there are a lot of people that come to church, right? They go to church, and they go to church just to go to church, but they don't go to church because they really think that it's going to make a great difference in their life. I, I cannot just sit down. I hope that you cannot just sit down and just read the Word. Uh, everything that I read, I, there, obviously, it's not something that I can just just immediately begin to incorporate into my life, but I have to understand that that's the goal. That's the goal, is to let God's Word change me. And I want to say, I, w I want to say this in a, in a gracious way, uh, please take it that way, is that the truth of God will always create tension in your life if you choose not to obey it. If you read it and you get to a place and, 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 and you get to one of these present tense imperative mood verbs that define whether or not you really are going to follow, be a fully devoted follower of Christ or not, you get to that place and you read it and it just doesn't make any difference to you, eventually, eventually, God is not going to let you rest in that place and it's going to create a certain tension in you. That tension is good. That tension is spiritually healthy. It's like, a, it's like a high dose of vitamin C. It's what you need to let God change you in your life. And so it will always create tension in your life when it's not obeyed, but it will work powerfully in your life when it is obeyed. Now, the goal of this series this series is to teach us how to change. We're looking at the what to change and we're looking at the how to change. How do I go about in a practical way, on a day-to-day -day basis? I go to work, I have problems, I have somebody that's difficult to get along with, I don't know what to do with them. How do I go about changing? What is it in my life that God wants me to change? And one of the key parts of that process that we've been talking about, I'm not going to really talk about it today. I, I will talk about it, I think, the entire message next week. But one of the, one of the things that we have been talking about is that one of the key parts of that process is developing good habits that help us to achieve what God wants us to achieve. I want you to think of it this way, okay? This is really very simple. Write this down. I want you to think of it in very simple terms. Uh, good habits produce good results, and bad habits produce bad results. If you have bad habits in your life, and I, I want to just say any kind of bad habit, we're talking necessarily, I mean, we're talking primarily about spiritual habits that you want to have in your life, and one of them is to reckon and to consider that you are dead to sin, but alive unto God and to Christ Jesus. But let's just say, let's just look at some bad habits. Let's just say, let's just say that you are somebody that smokes. Now, I don't know if you do or don't, you know? But let's say that you do. That's not going to have a good ending for you. Let's say that you're somebody that loves to go fast and ultimately you drive recklessly. That is not going to have a good ending for you or some other people. Some guy just got killed up on the road here. I remember when those children, those kids, those young people, how many, how many got killed? Three? Right outside our church here one night, they were drunk been out drinking and just going too fast and just thought that, hey, the world's right, right here uh, ahead of us. No, it wasn't. It was a tree that was ahead of them. And none of them made it. And they all died. And they still have this memorial over there that the parents come to. It's 
like a, it's sad. It's really, it's really, really very sad. You can always vent your anger and your frustration on people. That does not have a good ending. My wife and I were in Walmart, when was it, Thursday? Was it Thursday of this week? We were in Walmart Thursday this week. And we were checking out, we were in, you know, in Walmart now they don't have a lot of lines open that you can go through. So you gotta go through the self-checkout. And, uh, uh, and so anyway, we, we, we are in, we, we like to go through the line where somebody else does it because I hate it when they, I have to weigh the grapes or something and I don't, I don't know how to do it. I don't know which grape to hit. They got blue grape, red grape, you know, I just don't know. So I'm just kind of stupid at that. I don't do good. I, if it's one item, if, if I'm buying a toothbrush, I, I can get it, put it in the bag and move on. But we're sitting in this line, and there's a little sign up there that says 20-item uh, express lane. Now, we had less than 20 items, and there was a lady that was checking out, and there was this big, tall man behind him, big, big tall guy, white hair, got a phone in his ear. Um, then there was a kind of a short, stubby man right behind him, and then there was me and Brenda, and we were just there at the checkout line, and this big tall guy gets frustrated with this lady that's checking out. Can't you read that sign? This is a fast lane express. At Walmart, nothing's fast. You're just lucky to have a lane to come into. And, and they start arguing. I mean, we're not talking about a small argument. We're talking about a big argument, right? They start cursing at one another. And the guy's telling this lady, he's saying some of the ugliest stuff to her that I, I could imagine. And she's responding back and she's threatening, I'm going to go get my husband. I don't know where her husband was. I don't think he was in the store. And he would, he would throw something at her and she would get back at him and then he would curse at her and she would curse at him and she's on the way, and he, she's on the way out. She's got everything in her bag. It's in her cart. She's walking away and he still will not let it go. You cannot just treat people with disrespect and it turn out okay. I turned around and there's another lady and she's, uh, she's back, she's, she's right behind me and I just turned and I said, that guy is so disrespectful to this lady. I, I mean, she didn't have a, she may have had 22 items in there as far as I know. And this lady says, uh, and, and we started talking, and we, and we, were, we were getting along good. And I said, I, I, could never, I could never talk to somebody like that. I mean, what's two or three extra minutes in Walmart? If you're going to go to Walmart, you're going to have to wait in line. Right? Yeah. Everybody said, right. Yeah. You're going to have to wait in line. They don't have a fast lane. It doesn't exist. There's not a fast checkout there. And I think the lady that was behind there, it must have been her first day to be checking out. And I turned around and I looked at this lady and I, uh, we started talking and I said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm I said, I, I, I can't treat people like that. I said, make it worse. I said, I'm a pastor and I, I just cannot talk to people. Why? Because I know that it's not going to have a good result. You can treat your marriage partner and your children with disrespect. That does not have a good ending. It does not have a good ending. Lottie and Rhonda, they treated me with great I treated them with respect, and they treated me with great respect. 
I was kind of glad to be there. My recovery was easy. They made it easy, fed me good food, let me go to sleep and not complain about me sleeping on the job. It was fun. So what does God's word have to say about these bad habits? I want you to listen carefully. You can keep your place here, but I want you to turn over to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. I want to read verse 7 to 8. And I want you to pay really close attention to the first four words based on whatever your translation is. Because God declares the following as an unchangeable, non-negotiable, spiritual law. It's not going to change. It's not going to change for me. not going to change for Brenda. It's not going to change for you. It's a non-negotiable, unchangeable, spiritual law. And the first thing he says about it, he says, please, that's not there. I've added that. Do not be deceived. Please, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. This man started cursing at this lady. She started cursing at him. You're sowing cursing. Somebody's going to sow cursing to you. You're going to be unkind to them. They're going to be unkind to you. You're going to threaten them. They're going to threaten you. It just it was, Everything was just living itself out right here in front of my eyes. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I cannot change this law. I cannot change this spiritual law. It will not change for me. And that's why Paul says, do not be deceived. In other words, do not be misled into living under some illusion that makes you think for whatever reason that you have become the exception to doing what God wants you to do. Don't, don't believe that lie. I'm not the exception. Whether I'm born again, I'm not born again. I'm not the exception. I'm not the exception to gravity. And neither are you. So no matter who we are, we all fall under this law of sowing and reaping that we cannot change. We, we always reap what we sow. Now, what I want to do is I want to put Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, if you want to turn back there. I want to put it in a little different perspective, so just bear with me for a second. This is the first word, I've told you this often, this is the first word of exhortation in Romans. We've got five chapters that precede this. This therefore. You always have to ask yourself the question, what's the therefore therefore? The therefore is to make you do what? Somebody tell me. Look backwards. Look backwards. And everything else that has already been changed, that you have, uh, that God has completely uh, justified you and made you whole. Chapter one chap uh, is on sin, and and uh, that God gave them over. Chapter two is all the excuses that people leave, uh, believe. The greatest probably chapter uh, the passage of scripture in all of scripture is in chapter 3 of Romans chapter 4 is Abraham and being justified by faith chapter 5 is that we have peace with God he gives us all of the reasons why he wants us to live in a certain way to consider that I am personally that me that you are personally listen dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. I am dead to that kind of nonsense that was going on here in the line at, at Walmart. I'm dead to that nonsense. I'm dead to, 
treating people with disrespect. I'm dead to anger. I'm dead to, to just living however I want to live. I'm dead to that. So that I can be alive to God in Christ Jesus. I'm dead to something and I am alive to something. Now here's what I want to do. I want to give you four very simple principles from this verse. You want to write these down. This is, this is principle number one. I, I'm not giving you a lot of principles as we go through this series, but I want to do it in this. I just want to give you four very simple principles in this verse. Okay? The first principle is this, that the life of Christ should always control my life. The life of Christ should always control my life. He's my model. He's my example. He's my WWJD. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in this circumstance? This is what is always driving me. This is what should always be driving you. Pushing us to be like Christ. Let me say it in a very simple way. My life should always reflect His life. No matter where I am, no matter how difficult it is, no matter what kind of circumstance that I find myself in, no matter what's taking place in my life, whatever it may be, whether I'm having open heart surgery or got stage 4 cancer, or I'm sitting on the side of the road, whatever it is, if I'm in Walmart, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm upset, whatever it is, His life, my life should reflect his life. What would he do? Let me give you, a, uh, this, is a, this is not another principle, but I, you, you ought to write this down. I have a part to play, and God has a part to play. That's not what you write down. I have a part to play, God has a part to play. Obedience is my part. The outcome is God's part. Obedience is my part. The outcome is God's part. I simply choose to live the way that I know that He wants me to live. I place my hands, I place my life into His hands, and I do this by becoming obedient to God what I know He wants me to do. That's not hard to find as you read through the Scriptures. It really is very simple. And we want this to become, as a part of this series, we want this to become the habit of our life. We want this to become a habit, just one of many really, really good habits that every day that our life is marked by the simple fact that we are alive to God and dead to sin. I, I have to have a mindset, right? This is <coughs> mind work. I have to have a mindset. We did a whole series on, on mindset. It took a year. The next principle is really super, super critical to me personally. I, I want it to be the same for you. I can't make it the same for you, but I want it to be exactly the same for you. Principle number two is that being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus should be every believer's identity. Being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus should be every believer's personal identity. That's the way that you see yourself and that's the way that you want others to see yourself. This is how I want everyone that I meet to see my life. The lady that was standing behind me there at Walmart, I, I wanted her to, I, I didn't want her to think I was like this guy. 
I wanted her to think a little bit differently. It was kind of interesting. She worked at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. And she says, do you have a card? And I said, I do. I didn't know why she wanted a card, but I, I, I gave her the card, and she said, thank you. And uh, I don't know where that would lead, but it was a good thing. This is so important to me, and I want it to be just as important to you. I want to say this. I, I want to give you three sentences. I want to say it in a way. I want to clarify it. I want to build on it. I want to say it in a different way, but I want to say the same thing. Teach, repeat, 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 right? I don't want people to see me. I do not want people to see me. I want them to see Christ in me. That means everything. I don't want them to see me. I don't want them to see me just reacting or being mad or angry or upset or frustrated or irritated or saying ugly things and and just fussing and complaining about everything that goes on. And I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't like the president, and I don't like, I don't like the government, and I don't like this, and I don't like that. I don't want anybody to see me that way. I want them to see Christ in me. And when they meet me, I do not want them, let, let me say it in a positive way, when they meet me, I want them to encounter Christ and not me. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter the circumstances that I am in. When I meet somebody, I want the real encounter to be with Christ and not with me. I simply want to be the tool that God uses, the instrument that God uses, the means that God uses to set up that encounter between me and Christ. I want to be the instrument that God uses to set up the encounter that somebody else can have with Christ. Now, this is what I know. I know that life-changing encounter, excuse me, I know that that life-changing encounter will never happen. It, it will never happen. It will not take place if I'm not dead to sin and alive to God. <coughs> it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen today. not going to happen tomorrow. It didn't happen last week. If I'm just uh, casually okay with just living in sin and talking the way I want to and living the way I want to and just subjecting God to my ideas rather than subjecting my life to His ideas, it's not going to happen. They're not going to encounter Christ when they meet me. If I as a believer do not see my life this way, then in essence I have completely, completely missed the Christian life. Principle number three. Sin should never be an option in my life. I've got to consider myself. I've got to reckon myself. I've got to calculate. I've got to figure it out that I'm dead to sin. It should never be an option. This is an enormous statement with incredible implications. Is Let me say it in, in kind of a really practical way that may, may or may not help. But if you look at your life and you know that there's something in your life that you're doing that is displeasing to God and it is way outside of His boundaries for your life, as your pastor, all I can say to you is please stop. Just stop. If you're talking to people disrespectfully, if you're treating your marriage partner disrespectfully, if you're just always got to have everything your way, if you're just always living for yourself, please stop. Because nobody will ever be able to have an encounter with Jesus Christ through you. If that's the case. 
I made a list, anger, ugly words, being unloving, treating people with disrespect, arrogance, being unkind, whatever it may be. At that moment, you want to run. You want to run. You want to flee back to your identity in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, I am dead to sin, but I am alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You want to embrace that. You as a committed follower of Jesus Christ are dead to sin. I wrote down something. You can write it down yourself. I'll tell you the way that I wrote it down. Something that you can say to yourself when you get confronted with these things. You want to affirm to yourself. You want to think through. You want to reckon. You want to say, I do not live this way anymore because my life is supernaturally connected to Christ. And he, he provides me everything that I need for life and godliness. My life is supernaturally connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that I need, He has already promised me that it is Mine is more than just available, and I find it in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the person of Christ, in the knowledge of Christ. I want to read you two verses. You don't have to turn there, but I can, I'll read them to you. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says, As His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life, and godliness. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ who called us by glory and virtue. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things that God wants me to do. I can live how God wants me to live. I'm not going to just continue to make excuses. I am going to live the way that God wants me to live. That's my identity in Christ. When I get to something that's difficult, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to run. I am going to run. I am going to run to Christ who is my identity. When we were born again, it's like God unzipped us, right? And He placed Himself and He placed His life into us. Every morning when I get up and take a shower, I see this place on my chest that was not there two weeks ago. It's this, we were, we were, we were here for prayer on Wednesday night and of course, Larry East and I, we both have this zipper. <laughs> we had this zip thing with all these holes in the bottom of it. And I see this place on my chest that was not there a couple months ago, and it was where the surgeon unzipped me. And he cut me open, and he pulled me apart. It's a kind of a gruesome surgery at, at best and he placed something else inside of me to fix what was wrong he took the clogged arteries and he took a good artery from my leg and he put it in here so that now I have if I can say it this way a new heart I got unzipped. I got a new heart. They zipped me back up. And when you came to Christ, God unzipped you and placed the indwelling Spirit of God inside of you. And He said that I will give you a new heart so that you think and live and act differently. I was on the doorstep of having a major stroke or 
major heart attack, but in my mind, I now have a new heart, and something has been done on the inside of me that makes me different now. And something happened to me 52 years ago where God unzipped me and made me different. That's your identity. That's who you are in Christ. My heart is different. If you as a believer do not take these promises of God seriously, then you will literally miss the Christian life. You just miss it. None of us can live the Christian life disconnected from the Word of God. Ignoring the Word of God is as dangerous as ignoring the stoplights. Have you ever seen somebody run through a stop sign or a stoplight? Ah! I remember one time we were coming back from Springfield. I had been teaching down there at night for class, and we were coming back, and we, we, were, we had left Springfield. No, not, well, not Springfield. Sally. We had left Sally, and we're coming back to 302. And some car just ran. Stop, stop. We were about as far from here to that door at 55 miles an hour. And I, it scared me to death. It just scared me to death. I mean, they are just flying through this stop, stop. If you run stop lights, everybody listen to me. If you run God's stop lights, if you run the city of Aiken's stop lights, there's absolutely nothing good that can happen. Not one thing. You can lose your life. You can kill somebody else. Not one good thing. You need to take the Word of God seriously. It really is very simple. If I'm always going to be giving sin the upper hand in my life, then I will never, ever be a fully devoted follower of Christ. I want to give you principle number four. Principle number four. I can never be alive to God. I can never be alive to God if I am more inclined to be alive to sin. I can never be alive to God if I am more inclined to sin. Listen carefully. Sin will take you further than you ever expected to go. It will cost you more than you ever expected to pay, and it will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. Stated another way, you will never live for Christ if you're always living for yourself. God just simply doesn't allow it to work that way. Now, I want to inject into this message today, I want to inject two other ideas. They're a little bit different, they're not one of these principles, but I want to inject into this message two other areas of encouragement that I believe are super critical for anybody that sees themselves as a committed follower of Jesus Christ. The first is really very, very simple. I want you to write down these three words. They're very simple words. Write these down. Write them in capital letters if you can. God is able. 
God is able. Whatever you may be struggling with in your life, doesn't matter what it may be, it may be your self-control, it may be your marriage, it may be your job, it may be your finances, it may be the way that you treat people, it may be your commitment to Christ, it may be your children, it may be anything, it may be your tongue. God is able to give you the grace that you need to live the way that He wants you to live. He doesn't just ask you to reckon and consider and evaluate the right thing to do and then not give you the grace to live out what it is that pleases Him. I want you to turn in your Bible just to look at a, a scripture. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. <laughs> I just want to read one verse. I know I'm taking a little bit out of context. Context is king. I understand the hermeneutics of all of that, but I want you to just listen to what it says in chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able... Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above, beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. If I did not believe this, I don't think that I would have any hope. If I believe for one second, for one minute of my life that everything depended on me. In fact, I would say that the older that I become as a believer, I've been a believer for 52 years, that the older that I become as a believer, the more I fully and distinctly realize that nothing depends on me. Nothing depends on me. If I decided tomorrow to forsake everything that I know about God and about Christ and about His Word, it would not affect God's work in any way. It would affect me, but it's not going to affect Him. And it's not going to affect what He wants to do or what He is going to accomplish. It only affects me, and it affects me in a very negative way. His purposes cannot be thwarted by me. They cannot be thwarted by my sin or by my indifference or by my neglect. It just doesn't work that way. It just does not work that way. He will still accomplish whatever He wants to accomplish, either with me or without me. Now I want to read some verses. Just sit there and please listen to me. You don't have to turn to them. You can write the verses down if, if you want to. And I want you to just to let God speak to you and build you up in your personal faith through His Word. I want you to believe that whatever you need to live a godly life, a God-honoring life, that God will give you the grace and power to do that. We, we, you know, back in Romans chapter 6, we saw in the first week that we studied this that the reason that He, that, that he said for us to reckon is that he did not want sin to reign in our mortal bodies. And he says in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, you are under what? You are under grace. You live in the age, the time, the period of grace. Grace is when God gives you two things. He gives you the desire to do His will, and then He gives you the power to do His will. Will. Just listen to these verses. I'm going to read through them very quickly. Acts 20, 32. So now, brethren, this is Paul. He's leaving these uh, uh, Ephesian elders. He says, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I'm commending you to the Word of God, I'm commending you to 
the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God, I'm commending these things to you so that it will build you up. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful. God is faithful. God is able who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. With the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God's faithful. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. God is able to make all grace abound to you. I have no excuses. I can make excuses. I can live in those excuses. But God takes all of my excuses away. In a verse like this. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13. Therefore take up a uh, Christian like this. Take up the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand. Whenever the enemy threatens you. Threatens your life. Tries to hurt you. God will equip you to be able to stand against him. And then lastly, Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And no matter where you may find yourself in your life, no matter where it may be, No matter where you may be in your faith and in trusting your life to God, God is able to save you. God is able to help you. God offers you and me everything that we need for life and godliness. His truth in me is greater than the lies of the enemy, and they work powerfully. His truth works powerfully. The second area, the first is that God is able. This is the second and the last area. I love this. I think I've taught this many times, but I want to reiterate it. I want to bring it back in to the picture of what we are talking about. Is that God's plan for my life is always much better than my plan for God's plan for my life is always much, much better than my plan for my life. I remember before I, I got saved, I had all kinds of plans. And they were bad plans. They weren't good plans, and God changed my plans. There comes a point in our life where we have to decide who, who or what is going to control our life. But you only have two options. Let me give you those options. You ought to write these options down. All right. These are the only two options that you have. You only have two options. Option one is I will let God control my life. Number one is that I will let God control my life. Option two is that I will let everything else control my life. That's it. If you're a believer, that's all you get. If you're not a believer, that's all you get. I'll either let God control my life, option one, or I'll let God control my life, option, I mean, everything else control my life. God has zipped you open. God has placed His Spirit inside of you. God has given you His Word and His life and His Spirit. And He has empowered you by His grace, listen carefully, to be able to choose option one. You have been supernaturally endowed by the living God to choose option one. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can choose the best option for my life. And when something difficult happens, here's what God wants you to do. Everybody listen. Listen carefully. God wants you to stop. When something difficult happens, God wants you to stop and then He wants you to reckon, to think, to analyze, and then thirdly, He wants you to choose option one. Stop, think, choose. Choose God in your life. Choose self-control. Choose obedience. Choose Forgiveness, choose mercy, choose kindness, choose gentle words. A soft, a soft answer turns away wrath. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, that it may minister grace to those who hear you. Choose God. Just choose God. When somebody challenges your life in a negative, condescending way, just choose to be alive to God and dead to reacting in a negative way. The other day I thought to myself, not that I want this to happen the next time I go to Walmart, but I was thinking that if I had been that lady, or let me back up, if we could have reversed the roles and she was back there and I was up here and had too much, how would I have responded to that guy? I, I want to tell you how I would have responded to that guy. I would have chose God. He could have cursed at me. He could have done whatever he wanted to me. I might have said something that would have made him angry. Like, have you ever come to a place in your life where you know for certain that you have eternal life and that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? But I probably wouldn't have. Here's the paradigm shift. We've talked about paradigm shift in this series, the change that you want to embrace. You always want to be, to be reminding yourself and saying to yourself the following. I will not be driven by my feelings and by my circumstances, but by my identity in Christ. I'm not going to let my circumstances. Somebody sitting there cursing at me. I'm not going to let them drive me into their dark, deep, ugly hole. I'm going to yield my life to Christ. I'm not going to say, I'm, going to, I'm not going to speak an unwholesome word to them. I'm not going to live like they live. That's my identity. That's who I am. I am a follower of Christ. Always remember that God is not nearly as concerned with what happens to you as he is to how, how you respond to what happens to you. It's not what happens, it's how you respond to what happens. That makes the difference. God will allow you and me to experience really difficult things. How am I going to respond to them? Here's how I'm going to respond. I am going to reckon myself to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's a habit that you have to develop. Constantly remind yourself of your identity in Christ. If you are a believer or an unbeliever, you live in a fallen world and you're always going to have adversities and you're always going to have difficulties and you're always going to meet people that are dif difficult to live with that treat you in the wrong way, that maybe lie about you or say something bad about you or whatever it may be. But you have to understand what adversity does to you. Adversity always reveals your character and it always refines your character. So you have a really, really difficult time, a really difficult moment in your life. It's a, it's a difficult time it's going to reveal something about you. It's going to reveal what your character is actually like. And if you submit yourself, if you choose God, if you reckon to be yourself to be alive to God, it will refine you.
It will refine your character. I want to give you two options. I'm just going to read them and then we will close. When difficult people and difficult moments confront you, you have two options. And both options has, have very specific consequences. Option number one. When you choose to react in an ungodly and negative way, everybody listen. When you choose to act and respond in a negative way, in an ungodly way, your influence is greatly diminished and your impact on that person's life is quickly lost. You know, I, if, I, if I can use our guests as an example, if the first day I'd gotten there and Lottie had walked into the room and she had said to me, she's, she said, how's it going? I said, well, this, this, I, I don't like this place at all. The, Food is terrible, man. The care I've gotten so far is just sick. It's just terrible. I, it's, I, I, I'm ready to go home now. I don't like the people. I don't like the way they talk. I don't like this. I don't like that. The bathroom smells. <laughs> Do you think at that moment that my influence in her life would have lasted very long. Gone like that. It, it was gone after two sentences. Number two, option number two. When you choose to respond in a godly and redemptive way, your influence is greatly enlarged. And the impact of your life on other people is greatly increased. I'll read it again. When you choose to respond in a godly and redemptive way, your influence is greatly enlarged and the impact of your life on other people is greatly increased. So you have to develop a mindset that's telling you to choose what you know God wants you to do. Why? Why, why do I say that? It's because God has a much better plan for your life than you have. God has a much better plan for your life than you could ever imagine. And He is able to give you all of the grace that you need to become what He wants you to become. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Cut that off. Mm -hmm.